Hi everybody, I'm Simon from Easy Technologies and you join me today for our KES 3 bench tuning training video. What we're going to be going through today is bench mode, that's also known as service mode for a lot of you tuners out there. This is where we take our ECU that for whatever reason we can't do through the OBD port, it may have been sent in to us by a remote customer, and we're going to connect to the loom pins on the ECU itself to enable the reading and writing. It's a really nice, quick and easy method of tuning and it's also nice and safe because it means we don't have to take the lid off the ECU, we're not having to make any complex pin-out connections to the circuit board, no solderings required, no complicated frames and probes. Nice, easy method. Sometimes actually faster than OBD as well. So to start this, we're going to need to know which parts of the KES kit we need. Obviously, we're going to need our USB cable to connect it to the computer, and we're going to need the KES tool itself. However, for the rest of the kit, I don't know if I need a, a different power supply, I don't know if I need a special sort of rainbow ribbon cable, I don't know what I need until I'm connected to the laptop with the KES. That way I can pick out the ECU in the application list, follow the instructions, and it's going to list out every single piece of equipment that I need to do this ECU. So let's get started. We're going to connect our USB into the back edge, sometimes called the top edge of the KES 3. And we're going to plug that in now, nice and easily. We're then going to plug into the USB port on the laptop, whether it's USB 2 or USB 3, doesn't matter, it supports both on there. Most laptops now come with USB 3 anyway. I'm going to put our KES at the front there. You'll often see a little, I'll show that for the camera, a little data light come up on the front, just indicating that it's connected. Sometimes the red light for the power comes on first and then the data light shows. This just means it's got connection. On the screen, you'll see at the top of the screen, it's going through uh, the updating, the firmware validation, it's basically making sure that the, the tool is synced to the software and you've got a good internet connection on there. Remember, it is important that you do have a good solid internet connection when you're using this tool. There's a lot of online sort of checks and balances that the tool does and the program Alien Tech Suite does through the reading and writing process. Let's get into it then. So we're going to go to the vehicles on Alien Tech Suite. I'm going to look at the top of the list and we can see we've got all our different vehicle models on there. Now if you followed through on our OBD tuning video, which we do recommend that you follow first before jumping into this one, we go through all of the various stages of the software, all the different options, the news, the support, etc, etc. So with this one we're going to jump straight in to selecting the vehicle. So we're going to shortlist by clicking on the car icon. Now we could go into vehicle make at this point, but Okay, it's got VW written on the ECU lid itself, but it might just have a uh, Volkswagen Audi Group fag. It might be an ECU out of an Audi, it may be a replacement ECU that's gone in a car from another one, maybe a donor ECU. So one of the quick things we can do is actually click in the search list at the top, and we're going to type in EDC 17C74. And that's going to shortlist everything with an EDC 17C74. Now remember, when we're working on an ECU, and this is very much the case with OBD as well, Whilst the horsepower and all the other information is very important and helps get us to the right ECU type that we need for reading, the horsepower is actually kind of irrelevant at this point. OBD, it's very useful to get you to that correct ECU, but that's when you can't see it. Well, we can see the ECU. It's got the information written on the actual label itself. We can see EDC 17 C74. I don't need to know the horsepower version because this is used in possibly three or four different options from the factory. So I need to sort of cut out that middleman as it were, jump a few steps, save myself some time, take the information that's on the ECU to get me to the right one in the list. You'll notice on here when we look at the software, we've got the connection modes on the right hand side of the screen showing us the OBD, the bench mode, also known as service mode, that's why there's a little S for sugar and M for Mitsubishi in there so we can see the SM for service mode and then we've got boot on the right hand side. Boot is your traditional open the lid, connect to the circuit board itself. If we go down the list, we can see it's pretty much the same number for everything on there. We've got 1198 for the service mode. It changes to a couple of cars down here where they don't have the service mode enabled. Now it could be because there's a specific software in that vehicle for, well, it might be an Audi A4, maybe that ECU is using a different manufacturer altogether. But everything that's got boot mode listed is 705 and everything that's got the, what we want, the bench mode, is 1198. So I can literally select the option right at the very top of the list. I don't need to go through the complex sort of, not that it is complex, but the additional steps 
of selecting the make, the model, the horsepower, etc. Anything you can do to sort of speed up the process, and if you've got the information in front of you, use it. So we're going to press continue. Brings us to our lovely screen now where we have the OBD, we have service mode, and we have boot all listed out. So the three options that are available for this ECU type in that particular vehicle that we selected at the time. You can also see a little bit more information about what's on the screen now by going to the connection at the top. There's a little yellow circle with an eye inside it for information. If you left click, it gives you the legend. It explains all of the information next to uh, all the logos on there. So you've got OBD, tells you, reading and writing through the diagnostic port. Bench, reading and writing through the pins on the ECU, the service mode. Boot, of course, connecting directly to the ECU. You've got a coming soon and everything else you can see on the screen is, is listed out. It's a legend, it's a key, if you like, to describe what's on the screen. What I'm interested in is this one here. This is the service mode, this is our bench mode. And before I continue, I want to click on this button here for the manual. I want to see what parts of the equipment I need, what bits of hardware I need for this particular vehicle. And again, this is why it's important you've got the live internet connection because these manuals could be updated maybe every few months, there may be a new piece of equipment that comes out, they may have changed the protocol saying, hey, you only need to use half the amount of connectors that you did before, it's been refined and updated, you need that internet connection to get the manuals. So we'll see on here, first it says warning. To use this protocol, you need to connect a cable to the ECU connector. It's basically telling us next thing, incorrect connections can damage the ECU. Now, unlike an OBD port, a diagnostic port, that 16 pin connector that you're fairly used to, as you can see here with this one, it's got a unique shape to it. It's not a generic sort of rectangle. It has angled edges on there. That means really, unless you're being very brutish with the cable itself, you can't really put it in the wrong way around. It only fits one way. Now you could say the same with the loom plugs, but the problem is we're only connecting to a few of the pins. We're going to be using individual cables to connect to them. Well, not about you, but there's quite a few pins in there. The chances are you, you could connect to the wrong one if you don't follow the instructions properly. Okay, so that warning is there just saying, look, pay attention. If you connect to the wrong one, you could cause damage. And it is a risky operation, more risky than OBD tuning, but not quite as risky as obviously doing the direct the ECU with the boot mode. What they say is risk there, providing you follow the instructions and the information we're going through today in the training lesson, you'll mitigate most of those risks and really make it a really easy, straightforward process to follow. Just make sure you pay attention to those instructions. Further down, it's telling us how we can connect to the ECU, so it's given us a list of options on there. It's telling us um, if there's the ability to clone the ECU, you can see the little clone icon. It's highlighted there on the screen. This is just a little user guide on there telling you some of the functions that are available. Read through for that ECU that you're working on. You may find something specifically for your ECU that's like, ah, I've been looking for that feature. Fantastic. I can click on that. I can use the clone. I can now duplicate that ECU. I can take an ECU, put it onto a donor one. So I may have had water damage in this one. Uh, someone may have bent a pin, may have short circuited, whatever it is. If you can read enough of that information out of the ECU and it's a clonable one, you can then put it onto a substitute ECU, put it back in the car, and all being well, it should start up and run. So there's a lot of cool functions and features in here, so take your time to read through the options that are in there and the information. We're going to move down to the instructions, though. The instructions on there are showing us an ECU that isn't 100% identical to the one we've got here. Don't panic. Sometimes there's universal images used. So it might even be a petrol ECU being used just to show you, hey, this is what an ECU looks like, and here's a label. The important bit is the actual connections. They will be unique to this ECU. I say unique, they'll be specific to this ECU. There may be similar connections used on many Bosch ECUs, but the instructions, don't worry, they will be correct for this ECU. Don't worry though if you've got a fairly generic image somewhere on the screen. This one says made in Hungary. Well, I don't see that on my ECU. Don't worry, it's a library image on there. Go a little bit further down, we can see our available connection modes and it's telling us the equipment we need. So to direct connect, so direct with the cable, which is our service mode, our bench mode, where we're going to connect to the pins, we're going to need a couple of pieces of equipment. We're going to need our power adapter. If we're unsure which one, because there's the plug, and there's also, if you're familiar, the one with the crocodile clips that you can use to connect to the tool and into a, a car battery, for example, if you're out in the field. We can left click, and it will bring up an image of the cable itself, or that component, or that piece of hardware. In this case, it's showing us our traditional wall plug. 
You see this on here. Our particular one is obviously set up for UK plug sockets. There are a number of connectors and adapters in here for different markets for different uh, electrical outlets and plugs. So obviously use the one that's correct for your electrical supply. Put this down for a second. And we're just going to close that window that appeared on the screen. And if we select the next option down, we have multifunction cable. So it's telling us now what cable we need. Next cable. The pictures are all there in the system. So this is part of it, the multifunction cable. And we're also going to need to open, just to freshen the packet, we're going to need to open our multifunction adapter. So our adapter here contains, and you can still see, it's got its little bungee cord for packaging on there, so we'll undo that as we're talking. It's got a number of cables on here that allow us more flexibility, more control over how we're using the system. So in here you'll see, as we unwind all of the cables, you'll see we have some spade connectors, some pin connectors on one end, and then we have mail connectors on the other that will actually connect to our multifunction cable. So you may be familiar with the previous version of service mode or bench mode with the K-Tag, where you had a little serial plug that plugged in one end and you had several wires coming out with little sort of spade connectors to go over the pins on the other end and a couple of crocodile clips. You might look at this and think, how am I going to get this to fit into the CARES app and get it to fit into both loom connectors on the ECU? Well, you don't have to. That's what this multifunction cable here is for. It's all the extensions on there that you need. So we'll put that down there. We've got a multifunction cable at the side. That contains all the extensions we need for our CAN high, our CAN low, um, our grounds, our resets, boot modes, etc., etc. And you can see on the left-hand side of the screen here, just underneath the picture of the cables, it gives the colour coordination. So it tells us the key to the colours. So our orange cable is used for 12-volt supply along with our red cable. Our orange is also used for our virtual key on there. It tells you the extension for the cable itself. We've got our black all the way through to our pink, which is our GPT-2 cable. So those of you that may be familiar with the K-Tag, the predecessor to the KES-3, may be familiar with these sort of ribbon cables. These had a little connector on there that needed to plug into a connector similar to this on your K-Tag, and they were used for GPT. It was a TO6 cable, they called them. They had extra little wires that pinned on, so you'd end up with a serial cable with a load of wires, you'd then end up with a ribbon cable with a load of wires, and it just became a little bit complicated. It's been simplified. More rugged cables, longer extensions, we've got a good couple of feet worth of cable that we plug into our multifunction cable. It just makes it much easier to work with. If you don't need the K-line, well you don't put the K-line onto the multifunction cable. If you don't need the reset or the boot pin, you don't put it into the cable. So you only have connected to this the exact cables you need. There's no more sort of untangling sort of knotted wires and sort of a big ball of yarn trying to untwist all your cables to get what you need out of it. It's much cleaner and simpler to use. Let's hit the back button down at the bottom. That takes us back to our instructions. So we can see now we've got a couple of different types of ECU. So the two different types that are shown on the screen, if you look, the connectors are identical and most of the pinouts are the same. Now at this point people would say, well, a couple of cables have moved, it's time to panic. Don't worry. We can see our power and earth are in the same place for both options. Those are the really key important ones. Everything else is data communication. So if we were, for example, to put the can high and low onto the wrong pins, it's not going to suddenly spike the ECU. The power is going through the same pins on both connections. Now obviously you want to get the right pinouts, but the power and earth are the right ones, the GP2 and the GP1 they're in the right place as well. So both our GPT cables are in the right place on both connectors is in the same place. Our power and earth the same. It's just the can high and low that swaps. So we're going to set it up and connect it for type one. It's either going to read or we're going to have to option two and select type two on there. So we're now going to connect the ECU. So out of our big bag of cables, we've effectively shortlisted the ones we need. We can see on the screen we need a blue, a purple, a green and a white. And just out of habit, I take the power and earth and keep them separately. So I've got two powers and one earth. Worth pointing out, 
On my connectors, I've got one that's got a large connector and one that's got a normal small connector on there for the power. That's because when we look at the instructions, we can see that one of the connections is required on one of the big main power plugs that's a slightly larger spade connector on there. Next thing we're going to do is just match up our cables with their corresponding colours. So we've got GPT-1, well I'll take my blue one, connect it. Take the next one which is my white, look through my list and I've got my CAN high. You just about see that, the white connector there. I'm just going to go through and connect this up. And because they're all nice and colour coordinated, it makes it easy to see. Now in this case we actually have two CAN lows. So no matter which one I go into, they're both CAN low. Okay, so don't panic that, oh, do I need the slightly lighter one versus the darker one? It's fine. They're both can low, they're both green, just need to connect them up. Then need to get our GPT-2, which is the sort of pinkish cable on here. I've pulled out the purple one just because on the picture it looked purple, but as long as I'm connecting to the right one here, that's the main thing. It's important though, there is a purple connector on here, which is VPP. So even though I've got the wrong colour on there, as long as I'm connecting to the correct one, that's the important thing. Okay, and it's good to show you that now, because in the field, you may have lost one of the cables, please try not to lose your cables. It may have got lost, it may have bent, broken, these things happen in the real world. You may have to use a green one on here, even though you connect into the pink GPT-2. What we're trying to say is, as long as you match up the connectors to the right outlets on the multifunction cable, that's the main thing. Okay? We're now going to take our ECU and we're going to make our connections on there. Notice I haven't connected the power and earth yet. I use those last. Okay, we haven't even connected the power to the KES yet. It's just force of habit. Power is the dangerous thing when we're connecting to an ECU. Let's make sure everything else is in the right place, matches up first. We'll put our power pins in and then we will power the KES last. Okay. So now we've got our communication lines connected, we're then going to connect our power and our earth to our multifunction cable. You'll notice in that last segment that we actually used the pink cable for the GPT-2. We used the purple one before just to demonstrate you can use any colour you want to connect to it, but to make it nice and consistent here we're using the correct colour for the correct outlet. So we'll take our red for our power and connect to the cable. We'll take our other red and connect to the second red outlet in here and then we'll take our black one and connect it to the black earth or ground as it's listed on here. Again because I haven't connected any power to the KES and because it's not plugged in I can touch these against each other without any risk. Anything you can do to mitigate the risk the better so I really advise don't have this connected to the KES until you're ready to proceed to the reading or writing phase. Get all your connections done correctly first. So I'll set these up on here and then we're going to connect. It's important obviously making sure we use our big connector for the large power pin, our earth will connect in there as well and we've got our last power that we connect on. And that's it, we're ready to move to the reading. Now we've got all of our connections, we'll just check there's nothing else on the instructions that we need to follow through there for our connections. See, that's it. It's then moving into the read and write and backup process that we're about to go through now. Obviously, take some time, read the information in there, familiarise yourself with the process, along with watching this video, of course, but check out the information that Alien Tech have put in there, telling you the step-by-step -step how to read and write to the ECU. Now we've got everything in there in our instructions. We're going to close that screen. Make sure we've got the service mode selected press continue. Again, it's giving you those instructions now saying, are you sure you've got everything? Look, check the instructions. We've just been through it all. So we can hit the red cross on there and move on to the next screen. It's downloading the protocol, that live connection to Alien Tech server. It's making sure it's got the latest up-to-date firmwares in there and it's all ready to go. At this point, I will connect our multifunction cable to the KES. Nice click. It's a nice firm connection on there. Previously, you had sort of serial plug you're putting on and then trying to get those little screws to tighten up and of course every time you undid them you had the risk of the, the little bolt they go into, the little nut, unscrewing with them as well. This is just a nice 
strong, assertive sort of clip in there. A bit like a, a plug on a loom or a connector on a car as well on a sensor. We're also now going to plug in our power supply. We're going to take our lead to the back of the KES. We're going to plug into the top. And we'll notice straight away our power light has come on. Okay, so we now know we've got power. We're live. We've got power to the tool. Our data light's on there because our USB is connected, so we have communication to our laptop. All of our connections are there on the ECU, so that's all ready to go as well. The next thing to do is to try and identify the ECU. Just to point out, whilst there might be power to the tool, and it's again probably a, a step too far in terms of safety, the reason we did the connections we did is just in case any power managed to make it through to the cables. For peace of mind, the tool, the KES, does not put any power down the cables until you confirm an ID reading or writing action or clone, for example, any communication action on the software itself. So until I press this identify button, there's no power going through here. But we know what like with circuit boards, anything computer based, anything you can do to reduce that risk of any power getting through there when it shouldn't be, the better. Air on the side of caution. So we can see it's got some information on the left hand side. I'm not too fussed about the vehicle type it's found. I'm focusing on the ECU type. That's the only important bit to me. All that vehicle information is a guide to try and get me to the right ECU. First step I'm going to do is left click on identify. Now it's going to a small communication phase with the ECU. Unlike OBD where we've got to cycle the ignition on and off and on and off going through the various processes, there's no ignition. There's no CAN bus, there's no car, there's nothing attached. So it's much quicker in and out talking to the ECU. So it didn't work on that connection method. So what we're going to do now is we can connect to the other method. So power and earth the same, GPT-1 and 2 are both the same. It's just the CAN high and low need to swap. So now we've got it connected this way. And if you're unsure where to get the instructions, again, you can either go back and find them or you can click on the instructions icon at the bottom of the screen. And now, our power on, we've got our data and power lights illuminated. I'm going to press identify. And this process may take a minute or two. It depends on the information inside the ECU. It's quite a quick process, but it's just identifying, has it got a microprocessor? Um, is it external flash? Is it an internal ROM? Um, is there an EEPROM on there or E2P on there? It's just going through all that identification process now. So as we can see, we've successfully ID'd the vehicle. It's advisable at this point that we save the ID, just so we've got that on record. And we're going to save that as EDC 17C74. We're going to put ID at the end. Now I recommend that whenever you're saving a file, you save it as something that's relevant to that ECU. So if you've just been shipped the ECU, well, you should have some sort of details of the customer's vehicle, license plate, uh, registration number or chassis number, something unique that you can save the file as. Still put the ID at the end, as in ID the letters, but you need something that's unique for that ECU. The last thing you want is 10 files on your system saying EDC 17, C74. How are you going to know what car they relate to? And for now, we're just saving that to our desktop for ease. So it means we've got that information. If we ever need to submit it for a driver request, if we use an ECM, or our tuner or Visu technical team, if you're submitting it through as a client or slave tool, are asking for that information, you've got it. You haven't got to go through the whole process again. It's there, it's easy to grab, it's right at hand. We're now going to move to the read backup option. Now there's a slight difference in the software here if you're using a client slave tool or using a master tool. Now just to explain this, the options at the top for read backup and write backup, you're going to see those if you've got a master or a client or slave tool. The options down at the bottom for the read and write, where you can select the specific component that you want to read and write, that's only there for master tool operators. Now don't worry if you've got a slave or client tool, you're not missing out on anything. It just means that us as the tuner, for example, will have to decode your backup file, take the bit of data that we need out, which is probably going to be in the micro in this case. We're going to make the changes to it, package it all back up and give you a nice file that you just select write backup to put back on the ECU. For the master users, it's a little bit more complicated. You're not actually going to work with the read backup file in terms of tuning. You'll still take that backup. Please take the backup. As with anything, a backup is a good thing to take. You're going to be working with the advanced read. So you're going to be selecting the specific component you want, reading that, or when you save the file and it gives you the multiple options there, you're going to be working with that micro file to do your tuning. When you're writing back, 
you won't be selecting the right back up at the top, you'll be going to the right option at the bottom and making sure you select the correct thing. For example, in this case, it's going to be the micro. The reason we're saying it's the micro is, well, two reasons. We haven't got a flash option on there. It's greyed out, I can't select it. The only other option is EEPROM. That's a, usually a very tiny chip or a tiny file based within another component on the ECU board that contains things like, uh, it could be chassis number, it could be immobiliser data, it could be mileage information. It's not the tuning information that we need. It's not the maps controlling the, the boost or the fuel or whatever it may be for that particular vehicle. The other clue is it says maps in brackets or parentheses at the end of the description of the microprocessor. That's telling us, Edintex giving you that information saying your maps are located here. The information you need for tuning is in that component. We've also got the option for clone ECU as well. We're not going to go into that today because we're just trying to read the backup, trying to get that data off the ECU. So we're going to press read backup. And again, it's going to go through an ECU identification phase. Whilst it has already done identification on there, it doesn't mean you've still got the same ECU connected. Someone may have come in, one of the other colleagues may have come in, disconnected the ECU, plugged theirs in, not necessarily notice the computer setup, and just press read straight away. So it's going to do that confirmation again to make sure it's talking to the right ECU. Effectively, what's at the end of the cables is what it expects it to be. And we see now it's already done the communication, it's retrieving the ID information now in a similar way it did to the identify ECU function. So as it's completed that identification, we can see on the right hand side of the screen now, it's reading the backup. We can see reading micro and we have the progress bar at the bottom of the screen, a nice big bold progress bar, clearly labelled with the percentage it's at and that yellow progress status moving across. So it's really clear and easy to see. Once it's completed all of this, as part of the backup process, it's going to read the micro and then take a read of the EEPROM. So before it gives us a save option, it's going to read both parts together, almost sort of compress them, put them into this special backup file and give you that to save onto the computer. So we can see now it's finished reading the microprocessor, it's read the EEPROM, and it's given us our save box. So in a similar way to what we did before, where we had the EDC17C74 ID file, we're now going to call it EDC17C74 backup read. It's good to be clear on the labels. Whilst we could just call it read and we'd be able to see that from the file size, just be clear, it's the backup read. I'm going to press save. Checking file compliance, so it's basically double checking what it's just done to make sure it's the right file. So now that's completed, if you're using a slave or client tool, you'd now send that off to ourselves, to our Visu technical support team at our desk portal, and they'll get working on the modifications that you've requested based on the options you've ticked and selected in the submission form. If you're using a master tool, there's an extra step you need to take. Whilst we've got the backup, we now need to select the maps read. We need to read the individual component that we need. So it's automatically selected the micro one here because that's the first one out of the three in the list. If it was the flash that we needed and it said maps in the parentheses or the brackets at the end of the flash details, we'd have to select the flash by clicking on the little dot on the left hand side. We just need the micro, so micro selected, we're going to press read. Again, it's going to go through that ECU identification process, just pinging the ECU basically to make sure it's got communication with it. Again, the KES doesn't know if you've still got the same ECU connected at this point. Once it's gone through all of that, it will just start reading the ECU and you'll see that appear on the right hand side of the screen, a little progress bar will start going up and it will say reading micro.
So that's finished the identification process. You can see the reading micro ping on the right hand side of the screen and it's going through with that progress bar at the bottom, jumping from one to two and so on with the percentage. You'll also note that sometimes, and I'm not going to move it while it's reading, it's communicating with the ECU, you never touch the ECU, the cables, the power supply, the cares, even the laptop to be honest. But if you do take a look over, you'll see that the data lights will flash intermittently. Sometimes the EC1 and the key on lights will flash as well, just it's going through its process. Effectively, sometimes simulating the ignition key being turned on, it's doing all of that for you. So once this process is completed, we'll get another save box, and this time we're going to save it as the name of the ECU, EDC17 C74, but we're going to call it Micro Read, so then we know it's the microprocessor. It should save it with a .mps, that's mic. Papa Charlie, or Mitsubishi Peugeot Citroen, if you like, as the extension on there, so we know it's the microprocessor file. So you can see at the end of the reading process, it's then got the disconnection happening on the screen. So the ECU disconnection is basically sort of powering everything down, almost sort of taking the reading information back out of there and effectively powering off the connections from the KES to the ECU. Again, checking the file compliance, it's checking for any checksum errors or any faults, any, anything that went wrong in the process at this point. And then we get the save box. So we'll type in there EDC17 C74 and we're going to call it micro read. So again, as I've said all the way through this, put either the registration number in there, put the VIN number in if you want, I mean that's really unique for the car obviously, but keep it simple, registration or license plate is fine. Micro read is always useful, just so you know, that's definitely from the micro. I'll press save, and that's it. That's the reading process done. The writing is just a reverse of that. If you've got a slave or a client tool, you're simply gonna to go to write back up and select the tune file that we've sent you back from the technical support team at Visu. If you've got a master tool, you're going to be writing just the section, just the component that you're looking for. So in this case, the maps, that's the one in the parentheses next to the processor label under micro. If it was an EC where the, the tuning data, the maps are stored in the flash, you'd select flash and then press write at the bottom. So fantastic, that's it. It's right back to the ECU. We've got our tune file on there, or whatever the file is that you're looking to put back on the vehicle. We're going to disconnect the power from the back of the KES itself, so there's no power going to the tool. Obviously only do this once it says the operation's complete. That just gives us the extra added peace of mind that there's no power going through the cables to the ECU. So power's disconnected. We simply disconnect all of our pins from the front of the ECU there. As we pick it up, we then take the ECU back to the car, plug it back in, make sure everything's all nice and secure, and whether it's under the bonnet or wherever it's in footwell, wherever it may be, once it's all secure and back in place, start the car, make sure it's good, make sure it starts three or four times, give it a few minutes in between each start to make sure it's running properly. If you need to, check with diagnostics afterwards to make sure that the car's good, there's no sort of error codes flagged up, and then that's it. Customer can be on their way. And that concludes the bench mode, or as you know, it's service mode, training video for the KES3. Hope you enjoyed and enjoy some more of our videos coming soon.